All right, our next speaker is Robert Parrish from Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, his field is theoretical chemistry and studied under David Sherrill. Uh, practicum was from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Okay, can you all hear me now? All right, so the particular vignette I'm gonna tell you about this morning is a new theory and a new computational tool that goes along with that that allows us to actually go into a complicated non-covalent interaction like you have here and actually attribute that interaction energy to pieces of the molecule, the chemical functional groups. And I think this is an example of a much larger area of computational numerical science, which is very interesting, and that it allows us to take a, an overall idea of human intuition, that a molecule can be broken up into functional groups or something of that nature, and then we can codify that mathematically and put it into a computational model and replace human intuition, which can be very uh, fallible in many cases. Now, before I begin that, I have to preface this with this slightly whimsical slide, join the DOE CSGF and see the world. Um, I started with my undergraduate in Atlanta and in mechanical engineering, and it was pretty busy, so I pretty much just stayed in town. As soon as I joined Dr. Sherrill's lab and uh, became a CSGF, I feel like I've been all over the world, many conferences, many really nice uh, collaborations, and a lot of good work. It's uh, been one of the most happy and productive times in my life, and I'm very grateful to CSGF for what they've given me as far as uh, both fiscal support and the doors that uh, having CSGF on my resume has opened and the confidence it's given me. So thank you very much to Krell for what you've done for me. I hope I've been worth your while. All right, non-covalent interactions. If I'm gonna talk about them for the whole uh, uh, talk today, I have to justify why they're important. These are the weak residual forces that are left over after atoms have bound together through covalent bonding to form molecules. Then the molecules can aggregate through things like hydrogen bonding forces, London dispersion, et cetera. Uh, they are in a host of applications chemistry, and they're becoming more and more important, especially as we move towards things like nanotechnology. For instance, if you're interested in buckyballs, you might build a bucky catcher that would go out and grab that buckyball through London dispersion forces. If you're interested in building explosives, this is the RDX explosive crystal, and understanding how that packs together is critical to making its structure and function. DNA, uh, the bases stack together through hydrogen bonding forces, and then the base pairs stack on top of each other through London dispersion forces. And without either of those two forces, your DNA would fall apart. So very important to understand this. And then, of course, a big area is drug-protein interactions. All the drug molecules are really is molecules that have the right shape and that stick correctly into uh, protein pockets through non-covalent forces. And if you can do that, you can develop a good drug molecule, which will have good fiscal ramifications and good ramifications for society and being able to treat therapeutic conditions and things like that. Now, how we actually approach this from a theoretical chemistry standpoint is we try and calculate the interaction energy between two non-bonded molecules like this. The methodology we use in my group is Symmetry Adapted Perturbation Theory, or SAP, developed by Christoph Solevich and his coworkers in the late 80s and early 90s. This starts from the molecules an infinite distance apart where they're not interacting with each other. We build the wave function for monomer A uh, in isolation and the same for monomer B in isolation. And only then do we turn on the interaction between the two uh, monomers by bringing the molecule together. And since that interaction energy is going to be so much weaker than the covalent bonds that build up these two individual molecules, it's plausible that you can do that with a perturbation series. And that's exactly what SAP does. What you get is a series of terms which add together, and as you add more and more computational horsepower, they add toward the many-body sap limit uh, of the interaction energy. And you get a really nice breakdown in terms of four physically motivated components, electrostatics, steric repulsion, induction and polarization, and London dispersion, which we can use to talk about, is this molecule hydrogen bonded or pi stacking or something like that? So that's the way we approach it from ab initio quantum chemistry. That's a little bit different than the way a chemist thinks about these things. Even for something as simple as phenol dimer right here, any chemist worth his salt is going to look at this and say, ooh, there's a pair of hydroxyl groups here, and they're oriented just right. There has to be a hydrogen bond there. Uh, if you're really good, you might even say that there might be a little bit more interaction because the phenol groups here are undergoing a weak pi-pi type of interaction with some London dispersion forces going on there. But at the moment, all you're doing is using intuition to make that assignment. Um, so it's a bit hazy what you're doing as a, an intuitive chemist. Unfortunately, SAP can't help you yet because all it tells us is the total interaction. It does nothing about the breakdown. And that's where I come in, is I've developed a methodology where we can take the rigorous SAP methodology and break it down into contributions from pairs of functional groups. With that methodology, that's a bit complicated, so sometimes you can go to a little bit simpler picture where you look at only the functional groups of one of the monomers and how they look at the totality of the other monomer. That's an order one partition that tells you uh, basically how much this hydroxyl group likes this totality of this, this phenyl monomer here. And uh, that's a design metric that tells you if that functional group is working or not and needs to be redesigned in the interaction. And finally, a big caveat is when I sum up over all the functional groups in both of the monomers, I had better get back to the many-body sapped interaction energy. Otherwise, I have necessarily not produced a robust partition. 
And that's accomplished through uh, this partitioning methodology we've developed. Um, what we do is, after much headbanging, we realize we shouldn't invent our own perturbation series. We should use the existing methodology that Christoph Solevich developed and let SAP govern the interaction. What we then do is we go into the perturbation series terms, which appear either algebraically or as a series of Feynman diagrams representing the interactions between two, four, six, or an infinite number of particles. And even though there might be an infinite number of particles in each of those diagrams, we find there's always two that correspond to what the chemist thinks of as that term. For instance, in this case, this is the lowest order dispersion term. This is an electron on monomer A and an electron on monomer B jumping up into virtual states R and S to allow for a dipole-dipole type of interaction, which provides the 1 over R to the 6 London dispersion force. Now, you as a chemist care about where the uh, electrons actually came from in the Lewis structures of the underlying monomers, which are the particles A and B. So we keep labels for those, and we sum up everything else in that diagram. Now, instead of summing all the way down to the dispersion energy, we now have it labeled by pairs of occupied orbitals. That's the order two partition of the many-body SAP theory. The next step is that these diagrams are agnostic as to which particle set you use for these occupied orbitals, so you have to make a chemically reasonable choice. Our first choice was to go down to the level of atoms. We chunked up the electronic density into nearly spherical, partially charged atoms, and we accumulated things that way. That's not the best choice for chemical intuition because those atoms carry partial charges. So if you're talking about a methyl group, as a chemist, you think that's a neutral group. In this partition, it would have about 0.1 electrons on it, which leads to kind of large intrinsic charges. Uh, but this is actually more useful for force field development, this atomic sapped methodology. The second generation, though, is what we use for chemistry, and that's where I go to functional groups, which are neutral as the, uh, the entities that I'm talking about, and this is f sapped. Uh, the roots of this are actually a much older idea, which is if you're looking at this phenyl monomer and you want to split it into hydroxyl and phenyl pieces, you might chop it right here and then produce two fragments. Uh, you take the, the chopped fragments and you cap them with uh, a proton and electron each so that they're electrically neutral and benign electronically. Um, and then you run pairwise calculations in isolation between, say, a pair of waters, a pair of benzenes, and you get a rough estimate of what the interaction energy is and its contributions in terms of the functional groups. Unfortunately, that's not robust at all, because you've ignored the many-body effects that occur in this phenyl monomer, the intramolecular couplings, and you have the wrong number of particles in your system. What FSAP does is try and fix this. It actually localizes the occupied orbitals of this monomer here and can directly see the fragments we're looking for. When you localize the orbitals, you can see the OH sigma bond, two lone pairs, and a core orbital. You put the right number of protons with that, you have a neutral functional group to deal with now. Uh, same thing for the phenyl, and then the only extra weirdness is you have a linking sigma bond which bridges these two groups, and if you chose right, that's going to have very little contribution, and you can assign it 50-50 just to simplify uh, the, the discussion of the analysis at the end of the day. That's the methodology. Uh, it allows us to partition each one of the SAP terms down to the level of chemical functional groups. Now, what would this actually be useful for? Well. This is a very neat collaboration we have with Bristol Myers Squibb Drug Company, where we're looking at uh, this is uh, a drug molecule which actually goes into the protein factor 10A in the coagulation cascade. And uh, this, if you could do this, would be a drug which is a replacement for warfarin uh, for conditions like deep vein thrombosis and stroke and things like that. If you've ever heard of Eliquis, that's the drug that recently made it to the market that does just this. Two reasons why it's superior to warfarin is one, that you're not a hemophiliac. So if you get uh, cut, you won't bleed out on these drugs. And the other is that they are uh, neutral drug molecules, not charged. And because of that, they can pass through your gut and be absorbed orally rather than intravenously as warfarin is given. Now, the big breakthrough in making them orally available, making them neutral, was that in the protein shell, you have things like this aspartate group, which at biological pH uh, is actually carries a negative charge. Usually, you'd want to balance that with a positive charge in a drug molecule. We want to get away from that, though. And they came up with this beautiful series of ligands, which have an aromatic ring and a chloro right here, that were able to bind successfully while still being neutral. The question for us today, though, is when I switch that chloro to a methyl, as I just did right there, it doesn't work at all. You get a 50-fold decrease in the potency just from that tiny little substitution of a chloro to a methyl. And as an intuitive intermolecular chemist, we wouldn't expect that effect to occur. Um, there's really no reason those are about the same size, they have about the same solubility, all, all those kinds of things are the same. So it's only a posteriori that we saw that effect and are now trying to explain it. it that's the question. Chloro variant binds effectively, methyl does not. Why? Given that they know this, a lot of people have proposed intuitive explanations for why this would happen. Uh, one of the leading ones is this chloro has what's called a sigma hole, a little positive bit to it right here. And maybe that really likes the pi clouds of this tyrosine piece right here, um, forming what's known as a halogen pi type interaction. And these are very svelte and uh, vogue interactions these days that everybody's talking about. And I totally bought that hypothesis when they first showed me this complex. 
The second one is that, of course, we have this aspartate group here, which has negative charge to it. So if you do this substitution, you will slightly change the dipole of the ligand. Maybe that's going to have a differential dipole aspartate interaction there. Well, we don't have to rely on intuition to talk about these things anymore. We can actually just go in and with functional group symmetry adapted perturbation theory directly calculate that. We can take our molecules. We can calculate the interaction energy with the chlorovariant of it. And we see that it sticks very strongly. And we can get a breakdown of why it sticks into the drug binding pocket. You see it really likes the aspartate here. Red means attractive and blue means repulsive on these. Um, and some weaker interactions throughout the rest of the pocket. We can repeat the analysis with the methyl group. Um, also likes it very well. And then when I subtract the two, what I'm getting is the enhancement. I'm getting uh, how much the chloro uh, is preferred over the methyl and I'm getting an attribution as to why, what parts of the protein pocket actually cause that change in the interaction strength. Now I have it uh, a little bit better showing here on this penultimate slide here. Um, in total, our results from SAP show that we get about 2.5 kcal per mole of enhancement for the chloro over the methyl, which is right in line with the experimental finding uh, when you look at the delta G. And what we're seeing here now is the attribution to that to various pieces of the protein pocket. Now the first hypothesis was halogen pi interaction. But under FSAP, that is not borne out at all. There is no net change in the interaction. And that's showing us that our intuition was wrong, that the halogen pi interaction was actually driving that change. Similarly, with the aspartate, we see no lighting up here, so no net change here. What we are seeing, though, is uh, blue and red, both uh, attractive and repulsive contributions all throughout the peptide backbone um, that are actually driving in the net this 2.5 kcal per mole of enhancement for the chloro group. This is actually coming from the peptide backbone, so CONH moieties, which link the various uh, amino acids together. And as chemists, we usually don't think those have much to do uh, at all, because that's not what you change in proteins. You change the side change by changing the three codons of DNA, and the peptide linkages always remain constant. They always have the same topology. But it turns out those CONH groups have quite strong dipoles uh, to them, because you have a carbonyl and an NH, and you actually have delocalization across that. Uh, you get a dipole that forms across those, and there's just so many of them, and they can stack quite closely with the aromatic ring here, that you can actually get that to drive the change in the interaction energy here. So our intuition was wrong. FSAP showed us that. And then FSAP also showed us an unexpected finding of these long-range peptide interactions um, that was driving this change uh, in this interaction. So with that, I hope I've shown you that partition SAP methods can uh, uh, be quite useful for us. They partition the interaction energy contribution to pairs of fragments using rigorous SAP methodology. We have them in atomic SAP, which is for force field development, functional group SAP for chemistry, and more recently, a shameless plug for a, uh, a recent paper we have on uh, intramolecular interactions. We can actually tell how much this hydroxyl likes this hydroxyl within a covalent molecule with this latest result, um, and this whole series of papers on, on this. When we start to apply this in drug design, we find that the more complicated the non-covalent interaction gets, the less our intuition is trustworthy, and that things like pairwise contacts all over the pockets involving these peptide bond dipoles may be quite important. The outlook is that we really can't trust our chemical intuition anymore. Um, we're finding more and more cases, even beyond this, where uh, your intuition just breaks down completely. And the only good news is that symmetry-adapted perturbation theory and functional group SAPT are reaching both the computational limits and the, the depth of being able to go in and see individual fragments that we can actually use them to buttress our intuition and get a better picture of what's actually going on inside of these systems. And so with that, I would again like to thank the CSGF for the funding and uh, to my many wonderful collaborators and friends throughout the world. It's, it's been a great ride. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions.